We have so much to jam pack in today's video. Prepare your mind, get ready. We're about to talk about collaborations between Hong Kong, Saudi Arabia, Singapore and UK. We're also gonna get into some Korean and Indonesian documents in their native language. Who else is doing this? We're also gonna get into a Bank of International Settlements report that just came out. Big piece of news from today's video is the Australian Digital Assets Bill. All the links to my research from the actual documentation can be found in the Discord server. You can join that absolutely free in the description. And our first story comes in the form of an MOU between Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia. An MOU means a Memorandum of Understanding, and while it's not legally binding, it does show a willingness from the two parties involved in this MOU that they're willing to work together to get to a, a destination that's mutually beneficial. So they're both gonna look at emerging trends, best practices, regulatory issues, policies, and legislation. This is the collaboration we need to move forward. And this just shows how much smarter we are than some of these companies making these reports. If you think back to that PwC report we talked about yesterday, they said on that page that Saudi Arabia, I'm looking at it right here, Saudi Arabia have no regulatory framework, no AML, no travel rule, and no stable coins being used for payments. Basically saying that blockchain is playing no role in the Saudi Arabian government and their payment system. But here we can see Hong Kong, one of the most crypto advanced companies in the world, cooperating with Saudi Arabia. And they're both gonna mutually work towards their payment infrastructure and tokenization. This is unbelievable. And we also have collaboration between Her Majesty's Treasury and the Monetary Authority of Singapore. We know the connections here already, and for those who haven't seen all the previous videos, Ripple, the company that we are most interested in for their asset XRP, received an in-principle license basically to conduct business in Singapore from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And we also know that Ripple is heavily involved in the Digital Pound Foundation, as well as the Bank of England and a multitude of other areas. So linking the UK and Singapore together via a common partner of theirs being Ripple, you can see why we might be excited about a Singapore and UK collaboration. Now a little bit further down on the document, it talks about CBDCs and how the collaboration is gonna work here. And the collaboration specifically talks about Project Guardian. We haven't talked about Project Guardian on this channel yet, so let's do it now. Project Guardian is all about asset tokenization. This is huge when we think about blockchain taking over the world. Everything needs to be tokenized and put on the blockchain. And both countries, Singapore and the UK, have agreed to, co to collaborate. It's basically like that MOA that we talked about between Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia. It's the same thing between Singapore and the UK here. And when you dig just even a little bit about Project Guardian, you get brought over to the world of Japanese banking too, where Project Guardian is being used by SBI. Now, lots of people say, well, SBI doesn't have any affiliation with Ripple. Well, listen to this. Talking about SBI Digital Asset Holdings, and right down at the end here, it says this. SBI DAH endeavors to bring innovation to the financial industry by building an ecosystem for issuance, custody, management, and liquidity for digital assets. SBI DAH was via SBI Group Companies has strong links with other investments such as Ripple, R3, B2C2, Securitize, and has inroads to the banking and securities infrastructure across Asia. With businesses in Thailand, South Korea, which we're gonna get into later in the video, Hong Kong, which we've already talked about, Malaysia, and Cambodia. I mean, you just have to look at that. Strong links with Ripple and R3, come on. And this, this document that I'm actually looking at here is SBI Digital Asset Holdings joining with the Monetary Authority of Singapore's tokenization initiative through Project Guardian. And there is an element on cross-border payments and the arrangements that surround that. And basically the UK and Singapore have agreed to just share all the information. There's gonna be a big date where Singapore and the UK come together again, but that's gonna be in Singapore in 2024. And of course on this channel, we will cover that. Subscribe if you wanna see that. And also stay, stay around until 2024. And let's get into more about Singapore here. We've got a report that's just come out. This was from the High Court of the Republic of Singapore, and it was about defining what cryptocurrencies are in Singapore. Now we recently saw in the UK where they basically said, digital assets are not gambling, okay? So we got that clarity from the UK, but in Singapore, they've essentially acknowledged digital assets as property. This has a whole load of tax implications and that's probably a, a whole other video and maybe it's not that interesting, but we're getting closer and closer to defining what these assets are and how they're gonna be treated. 
Singapore, of course, way ahead of the curve. Now we've got a really interesting story here from Indonesia, and it's actually all written in Indonesian, right? So I've gone through, translated it, of course, because I can't read it, and some of their words are really crazy. But anyway, what we have is a series of companies that Indonesia have designated to handle certain functions within Indonesia, within crypto. So they've basically assigned one company to be the digital asset exchange, They've hired one company to be the clearinghouse and one company to be the depository. So that's covering exchange, so trading, we've got custody and we've got settlement covered by just three companies in Indonesia. This is their way of regulating crypto in Indonesia. Now, because I know how to get into the documents and, and learn some stuff that people have never seen before, and also another reason to subscribe, because we get into the source documentation on this channel. And if we don't get to 70,000 subscribers by the end of next month, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm just probably just gonna keep making videos, but please, come on. And from this document, from the Bank of Indonesia Institute, where they looked at their payment systems and FinTech, guess what they said? And bear in mind, this document is from 2019. They said this, we obliged and experimented. In 2016, we came up with an experiment with 12 banks that did not have any pre-funding relationship with one another. We gave them a bunch of XRP, which is a digital asset, and asked them to use that as a bridge currency. In the past, pre-funding looked something like this, which is on slide 18. But we believe it can look something like this it's on slide 19. Instead of having a pre-funded relationship with each other, banks and payment providers can leverage digital assets to sort liquidity in re real time. We gave a bunch of XRP to those first banks and asked them to participate in this, in this experiment to settle using XRP as a bridge asset to connect to fiats. After six months, they came back and said, this is great, <laughs> okay? This works well in principle, but my regulatory division will not allow me to do this for two reasons. Now we know lots has changed in the regulatory side of things, especially with the court case ending this year in 2023. This was made in 2019. First, I cannot trust this asset. And second, I cannot store the asset on my books because as of today, there is no accounting treatment. There are no requirements for how, to, how you treat digital assets on a bank's books. Consequently, I will not hold it or use it as you are asking me. Maybe in 10 years, this will change. But as of today, I will not use it. So the way I read this is all of the excuses not to use XRP are basically in the process right now of being completely resolved, if not already being completely resolved. XRP, the asset, doesn't have any regulatory hurdles anymore. It's not a security. You can buy it off the secondary market to use it. And in their words, this is great, <laughs> right? They used it. They actually tried to use XRP I love the language used in here. It's so relaxed. I, we gave them a bunch of XRP. <laughs> like, what is that as bank language? Anyway, so they used the XRP for its true purpose for six months and they came back and said, this is great. The only problems they had with it was the regulation and they didn't know how to store it on the bank's books. Basically the custody side and the regulatory side, both are all but resolved right now. And I very much got the feeling from Indonesia, from this document, that they are gonna use XRP as long as those hurdles are overcome because it was great. So now let's jump into Korea. Now, these documents are just full of Korean. I'm just gonna highlight quickly what they were about. One of them was about how they're gonna be treated from a legal standpoint for the criminal activity that could happen in crypto. And the other one was essentially setting a comprehensive guideline structure for how they're treated in, in custody, trading, income, tax, every capacity that you can think about cryptocurrency, they are acknowledging it in these documents. It's absolutely wild, it's so comprehensive. Something's going on with Korea, because when you look at XRP Fiat Leak, or whatever it's called, fiatleak.com slash XRP, where you can see the flows of XRP around the world, you get two of the main locations in the world that have XRP transactions happening. You've got the US now, which wasn't really the case before, and South Korea. Why South Korea? And why does it feel like this is a little bit late on getting the guidelines, especially how much South Korea use XRP? But you have to, as a country, push up all of these regulations and guidelines for your country just to be on par with the rest of the countries who are also doing that. And also, if you enjoy that I get into the documents in their own native language where all the other English people will be forgetting these documents, let me know you appreciate it by hitting like on the video. Now briefly, we've got a document from the Bank of International Settlements where they talk about the rise of central bank digital currencies and this was updated on the 1st of July this year. Basically offering a, a worldwide view, a comprehensive 
review of where countries stand with their CBDC pilots and whether they're live or not. You can see that very few of the countries actually have a live retail CBDC. We're obviously not that interested in a retail CBDC. We're actually probably more afraid of retail CBDCs, me and you. But when you look at the countries that are involved, and I thought this difference was really interesting, retail research and wholesale projects basically take up the whole west side of the world. You've got Canada, the US, and South America, and obviously parts of the southern part of Africa, as well as basically all of Europe, the UK, and a really good chunk of the Asian islands down there, versus the other side of things, which is the retail pilot ongoing. That's in red. You've got basically Russia and BRICS. We can even just put it down as BRICS, except South Africa, because that's slightly different. You've got all of BRICS and then all of the rest of the world doing different things, and they're prioritizing different things. I found that interesting. You can read into that whatever you want. You can also see that over time, you have the sentiment shift in speeches made by countries about CBDCs. This line is essentially showing that general stance being more positive. Really, that's all there is to see on that one. But here we are, the big story of the day. And this is the Australian Digital Assets Bill. And it's been said by Coinbase executives that Australia has to speed up their crypto regulation in order to stay relevant. Go back to that CBDC map. Australia was in the red, just like Russia and all of the countries in BRICS. Australia was also there. It's being left behind. They're only really talking about retail CBDCs. Bring them up to speed on the wholesale side of things. And the chief policy officer at Coinbase, called Fayar Sherzad, said he appreciated the chance to participate in this inquiry on behalf of Coinbase. James Bragg and his Senate colleagues, along with the Australian government, are to be commended for inviting public input and moving the process of legislation forward. Australia are starting to make some moves. And it is and it has become very clear that Australia are looking towards MICA, acknowledging that MICA is going to go live in Europe before the end of 2025, and using this date as a date to kind of kickstart them into action to say, okay, MICA has this deadline, we probably should follow the same deadline too. And Mr. Sherzad from Coinbase also said this, they were able over the course of, in, of the ensuing nine months to issue a consultation paper. They're talking about the Hong Kong authorities here. Issue a consultation paper, take public comment, put out a draft regulation, finalize it and have it go live. That is very, very fast, but it's an example of the speed at which markets move to, to be competitive in the race. This is basically Coinbase saying to Australia, other countries are doing this super quickly. You're really slow and you need to get your act together. And so with all of that, Australia have come out with a digital assets market regulation bill for 2023. And Andrew Bragg, who is a senator in the Australian government, said this, Australia is losing the race to regulate digital assets. That's why I've introduced a private senator's bill, the Digital Assets Market Regulation Bill 2023. They are losing the race and now it's go time. And of course now Australia has come out with all of the information about how they plan to have crypto regulation, acknowledging the speed of how Hong Kong is moving towards crypto regulation too. They're really getting their act together to be competitive on the world stage. And you can tell that Coinbase have this frustration with Australia because they actually opened up to Australia in 2016, but they failed to do anything to bring about regulation in the country. And Coinbase have said this, the sooner Australia acts, the sooner we can build and invest towards a framework that we understand will be stable and resilient for us to grow into. And as a result, Australia is next. Expect a speedy regulation production from Australia over the coming months. Thank you for watching this video. If you wanna watch other videos from me, if you wanna see the interviews that I do, you can click that video right below. You can click the video above and that gives you the video that the algorithm thinks is perfect for you. You can also click the Discord button to join the Discord absolutely free to see the links of all of this research. Stay emotionless and I'll see you in the next one.